um, the Ministry of Higher Education at that time, or right now, is known as Ministry of uh, Ministry of Education. We've already merged here right, both the higher education and education together. Um, the, <coughs> The ministry actually recommends the use of SDL, all right, because it's part and parcel of the Malaysian National Higher Education Action Plan. And within that particular uh, PSPTN, which is a short form of the Malaysian Higher Education Action Plan in 2010, we have this particular project uh, referred as the CAP, which is uh, the Critical Agenda Project. Those uh, projects uh, would actually help the ministry to look into um, many many aspects of uh, academic components in the um, in the uh, in the uh, PSPTM, and one of the most important one is referred as the project for teaching and learning. Right? And um, at University of Utara Malaysia, our university, the teaching and learning center, which is headed by um, Dr. Jelani, actually also look at this particular liberal education practices, which is. Um, trying to develop the holistic student development. I'll show you the advertisement that we have recently around the UTLC. It stands for University Teaching and Learning Center. And we've got all these critical project uh, agenda, or the CAP there, with nine different elements, all right? But the focus mainly is on this uh, HSD, which is the holistic student development. Um, one of them is actually to look at the component of uh, teaching and learning under this uh, collaboration or diversity service so learning and so forth. So um, from then on, all right, um, the center, which actually uh, the academic uh, um, center um, stands for Higher Edu Education Leadership Academy, um, actually um, awarded as the grant uh, for this study, and that's what. Um, We've actually produced the monograph for that particular um, research. And um, under the academy also, we actually train um, staff members or uh, lecturers uh, for various um, components in developing, uh, developing the professional development. And one of them, if you look at, let me point it, let me point it. No, I don't Oops. think there is a pointer. Yeah. All right. Um, one of them is the SOTL, or the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, all right, which is a, a, a huge component. Um, I was uh, involved with that with Prof. Roger Masna, who is leading the uh, SOTL team group. And we come up with training for three different levels, the basic, the intermediate, and the advanced level. So all aspects of other components are also part and parcel of the development for each uh, academic members to come in and do as a uh, under the Ministry of Higher Education. All right, so what did we do in our study? We took the definition of SEL from Brandis and Dennis in 1986. These are the main principles uh, that actually looked into the aspect of uh, learners having full responsibility, all right? The involvement and participation um, of learners are necessary for learning, um, equal uh, relationship between learners, uh, which promotes growth and development, and that the teacher itself becomes a facilitator and resource person. And of course, there are other confluence in education for the learner's experiences uh, to see particularly the uh, self-directed learning and the results of learning experience. So um, we actually thought that this is very important in uh, conducting that particular um, study because a lot of time um, people or the lecturers, instructors, seems to say that they practice SEL in the classrooms but there's not no documentation of actual use yet in the Malaysian context. So that's why we thought that if we do this, come up with a, this study, some forms of um, uh, information or uh, implications for teaching and learning would be important for the basis of formulating the framework. And um, these are our research questions. We actually looked at the current status of SEL in Malaysia, what are the issues and challenges, faced by the university lecturers and the implications in the um, SEL development of curriculum, teaching and learning methods, and the assessment practices. Now bear in mind that I don't have much time to actually go through all um, because of the uh, 15 minute schedule. Uh, and uh, what we did is we just give you a glimpse of uh, the um, report. And um, we actually did uh, this seven uh, conceptual framework 
from various studies that we've, uh, we've uh, looked at. And the biggest uh, would be starting from the left to right would be the latest engagement, latest empowerment, collaboration, teachers' role, what's for the higher order thinking skills, and then the several approaches and uh, assessment. And in each uh, context, <coughs> In each um, context or the construct that we actually look at the seven uh, components dimensions there, we looked at several other studies uh, to come up with the instrument as well as the uh, background. Um, in 2006, um, Dr. Mande and I have also conducted a, a separate uh, study, all right, and, and in that sense, we looked at the latest engagement in UUM itself. So from there, we pick up some of the uh, instrument and followed by other studies for collaboration, business empowerment, teachers goal, high order thinking skills, approaches, methods, and strategy, as well as assessment. So that gives you an, an, an understanding of the literature review. Then after that, oh sorry. Um, after that, we actually sent our questionnaire, all right, to several nation, public, and private um, higher education institutions. Um, but um, I think uh, we only managed to get 283 respondents all in all, all right, because it's quite difficult to um, move from one institution to another. And um, our questionnaire consisted of 115 items, all right, adapted from particularly Brendan McGuinness and Chu Wing Li and Lia. And um, we actually only analyzed the um, data descriptively. These are the sections that we have from the 115 um, total number of items. Part one, we have the variations of SEL, 15 items. Part two, we have the practices of uh, SEL in classroom, 69 items. Section B is on issues and challenges. We have 22 items. And of course, the last section is the demographic for nine um, different items. And uh, we did a pilot study with 32 respondents uh, before we actually run the actual study. And the uh, Cromba Alpha reliability is very high, between 0.87 to 0.95. How did we um, get those? Um, you see on the right column that on each part, all right, with the items uh, and the cases that we run through, and we get 18.87 for both part one and two, and then we have 0.95 for both section B and, and the overall um, SL instrument. Um, these are the profiles of the um, 283 um, participants who actually took in our study. The majority are females, sorry, majority are males, um, but quite a balance there because only 47.3 and 52.7, all right? And um, majority also are doctor holders, 51.6%, with masters, 456 and bachelors, 2.8%. Um, we have majority of senior lecturers uh, and lecturers, all right, 39.6 and 4.6, and then um, also majority are between two to ten years, all right, 45.9 percent. What did we find out? All right, um, highest mean score for e-learning or computer assisted learning for mean score 2.75. PBL comes second, 2.73, and the rest uh, follows accordingly. The lowest mean score goes for debates. Those are the variations of SEL that we did, all right? I'm um, asking them to uh, go through four different like a scale, not at all, seldom, frequently, and all the time. So you can see that we've marked the first three there um, at the top mean score for the um, variations. And uh, the bottom ones, as I mentioned just now, is the debate all right, at 1.96. All right. And uh, that will be the part one. We also compared the seven dimensions that we have for the mean score. All right. And as you can see here, the highest mean score goes for HOTS, all right, which is at 3.03. Uh, and the lowest for assessment at 2.56. Um, Top five issues and challenges, as I mentioned to you, the number of items are uh, a 
169 items altogether. I only zoom into the five top ones, and we have those uh, holding students accountable for tasks and given as the top most uh, important priority uh, in terms of uh, things that they say they're not uh, able to actually give much accountability to students in the classroom. That was the reason we said. And of course, preparation time, a lot of work has to be done if you want to conduct SEL with the variations that we mentioned just now. Others include allowing students to initiate dialogues, providing educated feedback to students, as well as allowing students to explore perspectives other than the teachers. All right, uh, um, I'm coming to the end here just to show some of the uh, SEL uh, pictures or sessions that we conduct within the classroom. This is uh, from one of the postgraduate diploma in education in UUM. Um, there are about 47 of them in the classroom and we do a lot of SEL brainstorming and so forth. Another one, a session that they actually have to brainstorm on certain cases that we've given to you. All right, And we thought that using uh, those information in the classroom would be able to do some of the implications and in teaching and learning as well as assessment preparation. So um, I'm right on the top, on the top for 15 minutes, all right? based on uh, research, right? I'm just going to share with you what we have been planning, we have been doing, and are still doing toward SEL at UUM, right? Um, because I think uh, generally we are all too used to traditional teaching. You go to class, you go through the slide that we have given to the student, and then <laughs> go through one by one, and then at the end of it, we have exam, <laughs> right? I'm not sure whether it is true here, but in Malaysia, it's still true even at the higher education, right? Okay, in, in any uh, teaching and learning session, right, I will say that we have at least these four activities going on, right? You present the content, all right, and then you have the student, uh, uh, you, guide, you guide the student. Uh, Can you press that? I think that's double arrow on the left. Double arrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, all right. Okay. Right? We guide the student to understand our content, right? and then we would uh, give them uh, time to practice whatever that we have uh, taught them, right? and then we do the assessment. Right? So assessment is very important, right? as in traditional teaching or even in SEL. Okay? And then, uh, okay. And uh, I understand that we do a lot of assessment, right? Whether you agree with me or not, we do a lot of assessment, and we are very com we are very comfortable we are very comfortable with testing as our tool for assessment, right? And we are very very dependent on testing. Right? There are some courses in 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 UUM which uh, has at least like 60% of the grade based on test only, and all the others are based on the uh, on assignment, and we are too used to testing, right? I think most of us have become expert in writing test items, right? And in Malaysia, as I said before, it is a reality. In primary school, right? In secondary school, and even goes into the tertiary education. When students came from the high school, they are used to being tested, right? They want more tests, right? But we are not uh, pushing uh, to the extent uh, that we want to on the SEL. Okay, uh, sorry, I put up any fact, but I did not pick it off. <laughs> All right, so we give them a, a descriptive kind of grades, or we give them even uh, some uh, numerical grades, right, for the uh, assessment. And then when we do the, uh, what, uh, for, for any teaching and learning session to be successful, right, we need to do some kind of constructive alignment between these two activities, right? We want to make sure that our learning outcome is achieved, 
right? So we do constructive alignment with the teaching methods, right? To make sure that it fits in with the LO, the learning outcome, and then even when we assess, we want to make sure that it fits in with the methodology as well as the learning outcome, right? So this is some kind of constructive alignment done to make sure that we achieve the learning outcome of each uh, teaching session or even of, of a course or even of a, of a, uh, what? Of a particular program. And when we teach and even and when we assess, right, we do refer to some kind of framework. Right? I think for most of us, we still stay with Blooms, right? whether the older one or even the newer one. Right? So we still refer to some kind of framework to choose our methods, right? to choose our uh, assessment tool. Right? So we do use some kind of um, um, framework there. And uh, this is what uh, Andrew, Andrew Churches said in uh, 2008. He said that the elements and action in the taxonomy of the Bloom right, cover many of the activities and objectives that we uh, undertake in our classroom practice, uh, either uh, teaching or assessment. Right? But however, they do not address the new objective. He's referring to the Bloom taxonomy of, of 1956 and uh, 2001, right? Uh, uh, the new one there. Right? And uh, it, they do not address the new objective processes and actions presented by the emergence and integration of ICT in the, in the classroom. Right. So, uh, and we also notice that the skill of communication, collaboration, and sharing have become an important factor or activities in our, our teaching and learning process, right? Because uh, the students use a lot of uh, tools to communicate, to collaborate their project, their assignment, right? And then share. And of course, uh, all these collaboration, uh, communication, and sharing now are being facilitated by a lot of technological tools, which are available to us just by clicking, right? And, uh, and we can do this by... Uh, Reverting or uh, going to the web 2. Point, web 2.0 technologies, which are available everywhere, anytime, anywhere now, right? As long as you can uh, connect to the internet. Okay. Even churches said, and communication, and collaboration, sharing are 21st century skills of increasing importance and ones that are used throughout the learning process. In some forms, they are elements of loops, and in others, they are just a mechanism which can be used to facilitate higher order thinking and learning. Okay, I'm just uh, reading what Chucha said here. And uh, these skills are becoming very, very important and are used throughout the learning process. Oh, it's just a. Uh, I must have. <laughs> copy the same uh, slide. Right. And assessment, right? We know that formative and assessment are very important. Right? But now with the tools, right, with, with, the, um, with the technological tools and with the skill that we would like to, uh, to, uh, to integrate in our uh, uh, teaching and learning, right, formative seems to be more significant and more important. Right? But both, both should be uh, used in, uh, in, in any uh, teaching and learning uh, uh, program. Right? So, uh, Stevens et al. in 2006 and Kuala Mars 2003 said that we need to go for the assessment for learning which is formative in nature, right? Okay, in 2008, uh, Churches came up with this uh, new taxonomy, he called it Bloom, Digi Bloom Digital Taxonomy, which he has uh, modified a bit of the older project of Bloom to include activities, verbs, which are, which, which, which match the tools that we have now, right? So especially if, if you see on, on the right hand there, right? those are the verbs that can be used to refer to collaboration. Right? So we do a lot of these things through the technology now, right? especially the student. Right? The students are very dependent on technology now, so we, 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 uh, we cannot shun off the technology because the students who are our main client are using a lot of technology. So even if we, if, if, if we are in the late 40s, 50s, 60s, right? We still have to embrace it because they are our main client and they are using these tools, right? So as academicians, as lecturers, we, we cannot say, I don't want to embrace technology. We have to, okay? So uh, he came up with a lot of uh, new behavioral verbs which match with the level uh, or the 
the level in the blue taxonomy and as well as match the uh, the, the affordances of the technology. Right, so we can address all these new types of learning, especially the collaboration, sharing, and integration through Web 2.0 technologies. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you just a few names here, right? I mean, I don't intend to explain all about these tools, right? And I don't in intend to describe all these tools, right? But I'm just going to show some of the few ones which are simple, right? The learning curve uh, should be very low, right? Even we, we who are in the 50s and 60s can use this because it's not complex. It's just a few clicks and you can use it, right? Because a lot of web 2.0 technologies now are very, very simple to use, right? So we do not have to be intimidated to use it compared to certain uh, software, right? You have, has, has anyone heard or used any of these? I'm sure you have too, right? Padlet, right? Uh, okay. Socrative. Socrative, you know, that was very good. <laughs> okay. So these are just uh, simple ones, right? Like, uh, I'm just going to go through uh, this one briefly, right? The AWW is very, very simple, right? Uh, most probably, if you want to get just a, uh, what, uh, uh, some kind of uh, simple collaboration, you can do that and have time to study go in there, right? Okay. And then you have uh, Lino, something like a, a sticky notes, right? Where you send things and then share things, you can share files, share videos. Right? And then ask them to comment. Okay? Have a Padlet. Okay? Uh, this is quite good. Right? It, 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 it used to be called Wall Wisher. Now it's called uh, Padlet. And you can attach even document, picture, and, and videos too. Okay? So we have uh, Twiddler, some kind of like uh, Easter pad. Right? It's, it's, it's like a whiteboard, but uh, it's a real time. Right? And we have uh, Scribbler. Right? Some kind of on, online, online whiteboard, and as well as uh, real time with audio as well. So this one is a bit more uh, has, has more features. Right? And we have a uh, voice right, right? This is also has, has uh, voice, right? You can collaborate. Add model, right? Add model is now uh, becoming very popular because it is uh, more like the LMS, the learning management uh, system, which I think here at well, at Monash also you do have, right? But something like Moodle here, right? This one is uh, cloud uh, based, so we don't have to manage the the, what, the, the, uh, the server or all those things. Right? And then, of course, the one which, which I've just been introduced called School Logic. Right? It's even better than uh, at, at model. Okay? School Logic. Okay. And then, of course, there are thousands and thousands more. Right? They're coming every day. Right? So, you know, uh, we, will, we won't be having time to, uh, to see all of them. Right? But, more are coming, and we don't have even time to catch up with them. <laughs> so don't try uh, too many, right? just use the one that, that you are uh, 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 familiar with and be good at one or two only. Don't be a master of <laughs> all. Okay? So uh, with the features in this tool, right, we can use some of this tool right, to address the communication the collaboration and the, the uh, sharing skill. However, keep in mind, right? Uh, keep in mind the role, role, role of thumb. These technological tools are just enabler, right? They are not core component in teaching and learning. If you think that the technology can help you to teach better, right? Help the student to learn better, then use it. Don't use because just someone next to your room is using it. <laughs> okay? So don't jump into the bandwagon, right? If it can help your teaching and learning better, right? Then use it. So keep in mind the, the rule of thumb. Do not let technology dictate pedagogy. You choose the, the, the pedagogy first. Then what technology can help you teach better? Right? And education should come first. Don't buy the technology first and then decide what am I going to do with it. Right? So decide what you want to do in your teaching and learning process first and then find technology that fits or can help you achieve that. Okay, so not uh, what is, it's not uh, the other way around. Don't choose technology, right? And then education. Education should come first. That is our main priority, right? The learning on the part of the uh, student. Okay, at UUM, oh, I have only three minutes. Yeah? So we are now using a learning management system which is based on Moodle, right? Everybody is happy with it, right? But from uh, from what we have been observing, everybody is just putting their powerpoints. Right, not much of the tool which uh, which which can 
At rest the SEL, right? But they are not using it. They still go to class and present, and then maybe some kind of a simple discussion in, in the class, right? And uh, since last year, oh no, since uh, 2010, we are now capturing lectures automatically in some uh, uh, lecture halls, right? So that the student who missed the class or who would like to uh, study for the exam can go back and review the lectures. Right? So far, uh, up, up to uh, this month, we have got about almost 4,000 videos of one and a half hour lecture each. Right? So uh, we have been doing this and uh, in 2014, we are going to uh, support these lectures for flip classroom concept. Where they don't have to go to the classroom to lecture for some, some of the uh, session, they just ask the student to view the last semester uh, lecture, but they go to class to do a lot of SCL activities. So they don't go, go to class and go to the, the same slide again, right? You ask them to view the lecture before and then come to class, we discuss on it, right? Do a short, uh, what, uh, uh, discussion, right? And uh, also this year, we are focusing on the content creation. We're having a lot of uh, workshop on this uh, 2.0 tools for the lecturers to come up with a lot of content. Digital content using uh, simple apps, simple tools, right? To put it in our open educational uh, resources uh, uh, portal, right? So we do a lot of uh, workshop on uh, technology as well as on uh, SL activities. And we have been uh, uh, recently uh, directed by the ministry to embark on MOOC, if you know what that word stands for, right? It's a massive open online course. This is a directive from the ministry for all the 20 public uh, universities in Malaysia. And I heard that they are going to give us millions and millions, uh, which is good. <laughs> we, 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 we welcome that. <coughs> okay, so... Uh, sorry. So with all these uh, technology initiatives right, and the SEL, right, we hope that, in particular, in UM, right, the assessment would be more of a formative assessment, right, will be more authentic in nature, right, will be uh, uh, performance-based, which can integrate all those skills which are very significant, very important to the learning in the 21st century. Right? You would have something you don't keep to yourself, right? they share, right? even on Facebook. Okay? This is a quote is from the National Research, uh, National Research Council uh, study. It said that the best learning environment are assessment center and emphasizes that formative assessment is particularly valuable for learners because it provides opportunities for learners to adjust or clarify their thinking prior to a summative assessment. Right? So we have to move, we have to make a shift to move for more assessment, more formative assessment. Right? Because at, at the end, I think uh, our general rule is 60% uh, based on coursework and 40% based on final exam. Even in the coursework, some lecturers have even more tests. So it ends up with more testing than the, the, the SEL assessment. Right? So I think this is the end of my slide. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Right. We will move to the next one.
and so they can see that in detail. And that actually works quite well. So these are some of the examples of articles I give them. So you can see on that side there are very academic sources, um, full re review articles and research articles, some government publications. This is a really ridiculous article that they try to claims about salt lamps um, curing everything known to man. And then the one above it is a secondary resource called the primary research article. So they've actually talked about it in more commonplace language. And so students get a variety of types of resources and they then teach each other in the class what they've learned. Now, it is very effective in teaching that skill. And the peer learning is really useful because they do learn in groups and you know peer learning actually improves learning for students. And because it gives them concrete examples of the things that they are going to be seeing when they research for their own assignment. However, it is very time consuming because basically the entire class is focused just on that. So you are teaching them the skill and a little small application, but you're not really going into any more depth because there's no more time. Also, if it's because it's a paper based activity, it does make flipping the classroom a bit harder because you need to provide the students with those paper based things that they might not be able to print out or can't see online and those sorts of things. <coughs> so what I wanted to do is to take that paper based activity and change it into an online activity that students can complete before coming to class or sometimes during class depending on the, sort of the time frame I have. And so in this activity they do it beforehand and then in class we have a seminar sort of discussion discussing what they have learned about the things that are important to evaluate resource and then moving on into a more complex discussion. So there are some things that I had to consider. I had to think, okay, it needs to be user friendly because they would like to actually see it and it looks pretty. Um, it needs to be able to link to other resources so students can take responsibility for their own learning. They don't understand something, they can click on a link and they can give them more information. It needs to be accessible outside of AuthCAD access, which is the Monash login access, so that it can be linkable from anywhere. And what I really wanted was also to get some analytics, some anonymous statistics, that I can see whether it was actually effective in doing what I hoped it was going to do. I also thought, had to think, of course, of the pedagogy. So what I wanted it to do was to get the students to learn through self-discovery. Because that's actually a really powerful way of getting students to take responsibility for their learning and to actually achieve deeper learning. And I did this through the use of what is called mastery experiences. So this is where a student needs to complete a real life task um, to gain the new knowledge and skills. And it has actually been shown, and I've got the references there and at the end of the slide, that those sorts of experiences build self-efficacy or self-confidence in the student that they can actually do that particular skill later on when they're having an assignment. I also needed to think, okay, about the master experience, they needed to be scaffolded. I can't just go, here's a really complex activity that you have no understanding of, do it. I needed to use what has been known for a long time from Vygotsky's theory, that as the zone of proximal development. So I've got a nice little picture for you there. The thing in the middle is just some known skill that a student has. The one right on the outside is the skill you want to teach them. And in the middle is the what is called zone of proximal development. So the area where if you target that sort of area, it helps the students to move from the inside to the outside of the diagram. They need to be authentic. There is no point in giving students an activity that's really whiz bang and exciting, but it's not actually what they're going to be seeing in real life. So this is something that they can have a relevance with. And it does need to be demanding, because giving students a really easy task to do just wastes their time. It has been shown that learning is most effective when students have to demonstrate persistent effort to get something to learn. And there's many studies that have shown that. So this is what it ends up looking at. What I decided to do was use Google Forms. There were many reasons for this. Firstly, it's very easy to use. The university has Google everything, so it was really easy to access. The Google Forms itself allows seamless linking to anything. You can embed videos and all those sorts of things, which I have done in this tutorial. Um, so it's really easy for students to use. It also looks pretty. It looks like I 
spent hours making it look really nice, but in fact that's just a template from Google Forms. You can change it if I really wanted to, I could have a wedding cake background, or happy birds flying around, whatever I feel like. I've chosen the very standard sort of blue color of my ash boys. What students do is they click on the continue button and it has a series of questions that it asks. So it starts all with that salt apps article that I showed you before. It links to the full source, it gives them the excerpt from that source. And it says, imagine you are writing an assignment for asthma, <coughs> you find this really interesting article, do you think this is a reliable source? So then they say yes, no, or maybe, and then they're asked to justify why. And they have to answer that, they can't move on until they have to do Then it gives them the feedback that that's actually not the best source of information, and it gives reasons for that, including that it's not based on any research, it has no references, you don't know who the author is, all those sorts of things. And then links to a scholarly sources checklist that they can download for themselves to use. Second question asks them about Wikipedia. It says, so you're now writing an assignment in history, you know nothing about this topic, should you start by looking at Wikipedia, yes, no, maybe, and what? So the point of that part is to basically say, well, it's not really the best place for you to find information, but yes, it does sometimes give you some links to resources at the end that you can then go and look for that information. Then it follows on that same history question and gives them an example of a source that's from the Yahoo Voices website, I think, that is basically like the Boxer Rebellion for Dummies. And it has some information, but it is written a bit more technical. It says the author is a historian, but it doesn't really have any references and you're not really sure. So then it asks them to actually say what do they think are the things that make it a good source and the things that make it a bad source. And I do that on purpose to build on the previous one where I said these are some things that indicate the other one was a bad source. Now think a bit more deeply. Okay, what do you think makes this a good source? What do you think makes this a bad source and rate it for reliability? And then the final one is an actual technical article, research article about parrots tending to use their left feet to eat food. Apparently that's a thing. And so that is actually a high quality article and the aim is for the students to then, when they answer how reliable is this, to realize that that is a reliable source. Now some important things to note is that the samples the examples are potentially not subject specific. And that is because that helps students to focus not so much on the content, but actually on the skill behind the content. So the skill behind learning how to evaluate sources. So it goes from asthma, history, parrots, all those sorts of really generic things that they can use. So some examples of the statistics I've gotten so far. Question about the salt lamps and asthma. 70% of students realize that that's not a good source, which is probably a bit concerning that the other 29% say yes, it is a good source. And I will show you the reasons they give on the next slide. So, why now? Why isn't it a good source? That indicates students who actually already get the concept of evaluative. They have things like it doesn't come from a peer-reviewed source, it doesn't have any references, argument is one-sided, so they're clearly students who already grasp the concept. The other ones indicate that students are focusing on the content rather than the actual question. So it says, it answers the question, because I asked, would this be a, a good article to answer whether so, whether, how you can cure asthma? And the article says, salt labs will cure asthma. But they haven't actually considered, well, is that actually a reliable piece of evidence? They just said, well, it answers the question, it says yes. Or, we get a better explanation of how the salt lab works, obviously they then know how things work. So those sorts of answers indicate to me that the students are looking at the content, but not really thinking deeper about the actual source of the information that they're reading. So using Wikipedia is a 50-50 split between students at the moment. No, Wikipedia is the worst source ever. Or, well, sometimes you can get some useful information from it, but it shouldn't be your main source. And I think that pretty much indicates what we feel like as lecturers ourselves. Sometimes we say, no, just don't go there. Sometimes we want, we might be able to get some interesting references. When I ask them to indicate things that they think makes a source look good in regards to the history article, 
the author is a historian, is very big on my list, and it also says Jen is a historian and has written several publications, including History for Dummies. So, author has written several publications, comes up really high. Other things are articles easy to understand, the information sounds correct, and it has some Chinese words that clearly it knows about the crossword. When asked whether it's unreliable, the big one, no references, no author affiliation, and no links to further information. And then things like, it doesn't sound really technical, and it sounds a bit unreliable, the website is hosted. So they're starting to actually look a bit more deep at the actual contents source more than the content itself. So then in regards to food preference, we now have pretty much 97% of students realizing that that is a good source of information. From where at the start we had 30% of students who thought that the salt was a good source of information. So they have actually moved beyond that content basic searching that we're looking for. And why? Because then they start listing the actual things that are useful. So that it's peer reviewed, it has proper statistics, the author affiliations are there. And these are some representative examples. I have 40 more that say basically the same thing. So they have actually learned that skills. That then links to a video where I provide the basic information that I usually would provide in a class, which student watches before coming to class. So what then happens is they watch the video, they do the tutorial, they come to class, and then we discuss what they learn. So what did they learn about what makes a good source, where can they find those good sources, and then moving to the deeper things like using those sources to build their arguments more effectively and those sorts of higher order things. I changed my presentation somewhat uh, just to talk about what we do to really give you a feel for what we're about in, in terms of student learning, student centred learning. And all of this arose through when I was course coordinator, and the students come say, oh, I'm graduating, and say, oh, that's great, you must be glad to get out of here at last. <laughs> and they'd say, yeah, but I don't know how my 24 units fit together. I don't know why I did management students, I don't know why I did economics and so forth. So we sat down, and I thought, well, what can we do? We need to create a facility. So what we created effectively was a trading room. Bear in mind, we're in finance. And so um, this is what it is. I have two trading rooms at Caulfield. I'm uh, largely I'm a facilitator or chief executive officer, and the students do all the work. Why? Because they're probably smarter than me. But in actual fact, let's, uh, let's look at what we do first with this quick video. We did this in class.
The Department of Accounting and Finance and the Faculty of Business and Economics seeks to establish Monash University as the leading institute in teaching and research. One of the things we want to do uh, as a student is not only give you the theory of finance, which is very important. If you don't have the theory, you really can't see where the practice goes. But what we want to do is give you both theory of finance and practice of finance. So when you go out into the real world, you're not, you're not an abstract, imaginary human being like myself, uh, but you're very finely tuned. You know exactly what's happening in theory, what's being taught in class, and you know how to apply these things in the real world. There's a bit of pressure, even though it's uh, not real money. You sort of get into the, um, the spirit of it. If you make a loss, you make a big win, you're quite impressed with yourself or down on yourself. It's a marvellous experience for both the staff and the students. The staff get an enjoyment out of teaching it and the students enjoy the practical application. The other thing to recognise is the students need to make their degree work almost instantaneously. The more we can prepare our students to meet the workforce, the more employable they'll be and from the employer's perspective is what we're actually adding back in the ministry. And that's a quicker way of actually uh, indicating to you um, what we do uh, within the classroom. Now, it's, in an undergraduate degree, it's one unit out of 24, so it's less than 5% of their studies. Uh, Postgraduate, it's one out of 16, so it's what, 6 or 7% of their studies um, in terms of doing this unit. And a lot of it is aimed at actually making them consolidate their knowledge from the lecture halls from their previous studies. So I don't lecture any of that. The whole expectation is you pass the subject, you should know it, perhaps you should go back and review these particular things. What we're doing is we're trading through the, through the, the, uh, through the marketplace. Uh, won't worry about too much about the key objectives, okay? But largely, uh, I did uh, my doctoral studies, interesting enough, in practical attributes, and the whole idea of bringing this around, even though I've been in finance for over 40 years, um, is I developed it around the whole idea of graduate attributes about people becoming international citizens, about becoming scholars, about working for the betterment of itself and the community, let alone intellectual uh, autonomy and so forth. So what we're really doing there is build on the theoretical fine, uh, finance concepts in a safe learning environment. Our Mayish graduates do not like to be wrong. But the more you get wrong in this room, the more you learn. So in actual fact, as people try to make profitability or try to do things in the marketplace, they make mistakes and they begin to enjoy the fact that it's a learning environment. So we don't talk assessment. You're not allowed to talk assessment. You can talk about how we're going to be assessed, perhaps, but it's all about learning. What did you learn? What have you learned so far? If you want to talk about the assessment, how does that affect the learning that's been developed, not just by myself, but my colleagues? Now, it's a unique class. It's a four-hour class, so the university hates me in terms of timetabling. It doesn't have to go four hours. We have trading sessions, and so if you want to be a trader, you have to be able to sit at that screen for eight, 12 hours a day. So it's part of that experience. But we have breaks during trading. We have guest speakers who come in during, during, during the breaks. Um, they have networking opportunities and so forth. So it's preparation for the working environment. They are well aware that they are responsible for their own learning. We are not. We are responsible for the good facilitation of the course. So they have to embrace that. I am a CEO, not an academic. So I talk to them like a CEO, a little bit rougher than perhaps an academic when I speak to them in terms of looking at it. And they're aware that we're actually teaching two years out. We know what we've got to do in 12 weeks. But in actual fact, we get emails two years later, ah, oh, this finally makes sense. I might have got a high distinction, but it's been driving me crazy about these types of things. So we're actually looking on a further horizon. There's about 45% which is, is done in teams with, with peer review. We have peer review sheets that actually tell us what was the contribution of each student within there. Now that's not entirely reliable and this semester we're introducing the idea of a team contract to try and push that back to the students. We have lots of guest speakers who come in which is why the four hours are so good, you can be great and so forth. And assessments derived from industry. So it's applied, report writing. Industry tells us our, our graduates can't write reports. Well, they're wrong, they can, but they tend to be of an academic nature. So being a CEO, they in actual fact have to uh, 
have to report to me in management accounting and annual reports, and I have a, a few copies up the back if you'd like to, to look at them later. Um, industry is flabbergasted by the quality of the work of Monash graduates. They often say our, our people could be produce these types of reports. And to be honest with you, the quality of what they produce, I have no right to really expect. But it happens, so that's fantastic about what we do. So if you need to understand why theory is important, we can actually talk about a theoretical concept they could use in their trading and why it won't work, as it was taught from the textbook. But if we make a, a few simple adjustments to what's going on, the theory will work. So it has validity. So they can start to see, yeah, I mean, now I know why I'm talking about those issues. within there. Our formal assessment, we have something like 10 pieces of assessment. Uh, people are telling me there's too much assessment and there is no exam. And it is continuous. If you want to be in the workforce, you have to perform every day. So you might as well have continuous assessment. Um, put us through you know, individually, quizzes, tests, assignments, presentations, production of, of business reports. Now, all these assessments um, are driven from industry, but students actually tell us what's causing problems. As an example, we used to make them give us um, weekly reports. Too much work, Kevin. We'd rather do presentations. So we survey our students every semester and ask them what was wrong with the assessment and then we make a value judgment because at the end of the day we are responsible. There's a whole heap of informal things that happen. Um, there's an informal presentation, for example, one of my lecturers that was pregnant, so a student made a presentation to her before she went had a baby last year. When guest speakers come in, we ask them to thank them, but it's impromptu. We don't give them any notice other than about five minutes. We'd like to do this. And they do a, a fantastic job in terms of it. There's a whole heap of uh, student involvement, and we can't get to the website, but, but it's up there. We have dignitaries coming through all the time meeting students. Um, Vice Chancellor, Dean, because it's a class that you can interrupt. It's not a lecture, first two weeks are, but when they're trading, it's easy for people to walk in and walk around and actually see, see what they're doing. One of the key events that runs out of this is the uh, a student body. They run our open day competition for us, for open day they're able to actually talk to the parents about what they've learned at the university, how it applies. It, it, in actual fact, I'm a student in, so they can really add work and or run after it, but it's fantastic in terms of what they do. Now, this is a survey, and I won't go through this survey, but it's part of the research that we've actually come out of it. I'll just touch on a couple of points. I'm well prepared for employment, 43.8% pre-survey, 69% 12 weeks later. And look at the growth in the females further area for research, they're bearing in mind that you know, the large proportion of our students are international students and the females by far, the growth is, is absolutely enormous. Learning strategies, okay, learning is largely instructor-led, goes from 51 to 42 percent of the males, but the females, it drops dramatically. I'm able to monitor how effective the matter, we go that, we touch on a few other points. Uh, I won't go through this uh, because I just want to give you a flow for what to do. Now we have two star labs, they're four floors apart. I spend all my time in the lift, which means I can't do very much in the factory, can I? Going through and, and facilitating with them. Uh, Malaysia has set up a similar uh, facility as ours, and we're currently negotiating in actual fact to put uh, the software that, that I use, which I developed myself, into Malaysia. And we are hoping next year, but that's always ambitious, um, to actually trade real time with Malaysian students. How good would that be? It's only a three hour time zone. I know the software works because I've taught my classes from America when I'm at conferences and hotel rooms, but the time zone is dreadful, absolutely dreadful. But three hours is one of the exciting projects that we're actually looking to do. That would be a great value to our students here, and fantastic value, I think, also back to, to uh, Malaysia, and that's something we're currently in very serious discussions with. <coughs> Let's just go through the comments from last semester. Um, this subject provides a competitive environment which allows hardworking students to excel through pre troop work. Training simulation provides students a taste of how markets work, allows them to think outside the box in terms of solutions. Bonus marks, there are a series of bonus marks. Profitability is bonus marks because it's all an element of luck that you make the most profit. But they all strive to get the bonus marks, but there are also penalty marks for not doing things. Working in teams, the subject allows students to work together and operate as a bank, encourage students to work together and collaborate effectively. Uh, the structure of this, this subject is excellent, where students learn as they trade, lecture throws in curveballs, where students are required to react quickly and effectively. 
our students trade on the telephone because most of them are international students. So they have to be able to think in English, talk in English, make decisions in English, so that when they actually go home, that hopefully their English skills have, have improved dramatically. The other thing about the commitment with the students is consultation. I shouldn't say consider, come to consultations often. I run my consultation 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. two or three nights a week because that's when the postgraduate students start getting interested. Now, a lot of that consultation is about trading before the market opens. Kevin, can I do a deal? So they're trying to take advantage of the market before it opens. And I'm quite happy to actually put that commitment in. I mean, I mean to say, I just do normal administrative work while I'm doing that, so it doesn't really have a real effect. But actually, the night before, they're actually hyped up before they walk in. Because they've got positions, they know you're interested, and, and I think that has an enormous effect. The other thing I want to talk about is my teaching team. Um, at the postgraduate level, I, I, I am the only uh, academic, and, and uh, at undergraduate level, we just brought in a, a new uh, lecturer. All of my teaching team are PhD students. And what we're trying to do with our PhD students, especially with those that want to go into academia, is to actually show them different ways of learning and teaching, especially the international PhD students. As an example, my pride and joy, who's about to graduate with a PhD, although I'd like to stop her if I could, no, that's not true, um, is, this is her last semester, she's actually an academic from, from uh, the University of Economics in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, she's been working with me, I've learned a lot about how she teaches Vietnamese students and, and her insight, and hopefully she's learned an awful lot about how we're actually working together. Um, she'll go back to that university. We're, we're looking at actually introducing the same idea of the Star Lab uh, there. We're, we're a fair way down the track in terms of doing that. But it's, uh, it's not just about the students, it's about bringing the PhD students through the teaching team, and it's all about. Uh, <coughs> Now, I'll touch on a couple of things. Now, these are industry things, and, and largely this is what we do. But have a look at this. We have, it's a brand new facility, one of our rooms. These three girls, we, um, the Vice Chancellor opened the room for us, um, and students generally don't get invited to those things. So, what I said, we run a foreign exchange competition, so students had to be invited. Or we, we conducted a competition. These three girls, who I was surprised they won, but there was a valuable lesson. They didn't make the most during training, but they knew when to stop. So the other guys who made more money lost it in the intermediate <laughs> period that they won. But this is part of bringing our students, meeting at the, the senior people of our, our staff. And I know the dean hates me sometimes, but I get him to come into my class, introduce himself, talk about what we're doing, because it's an important part of, especially with international students, knowing that, hey, I'm not just a student, they think I'm important too, and they do even though sometimes they give me a hard time. So, I'll finish there, but this is my favourite photo. <laughs> so I'll finish there, Matthew, just in, in terms of... Thank you. Stay around for some questions in a minute as well. Yeah, I will. Be part of our...
something like introducing air conditioning to a shopping mall. If you're the first shopping mall to introduce air conditioning, chances are you'll have a huge influx of customers and be very popular. But at some point, it reaches saturation and no longer is air conditioning such a fancy thing. In fact, if you're the only one who's left that doesn't have air conditioning, you're not going to have any customers and everybody else will be marching. And I'm wondering if that's the situation that we've come to in higher education. So in terms of uh, the Google survey that I've conducted, um, I also conducted a survey in 2011 and 2012, uh, asking the students just to my own school and then expanded this in 2013, about how frequently they use Google. And as you can see from this graph, the frequency of use has increased. So the proportion of students who say that they use heavily or frequently, at least twice a week, has increased. And the number who report um, that they use it infrequently or only to catch up with things has decreased over time. What I think is quite interesting though is to look at the devices, the ways in which students are accessing Google. And we find that students show a much more dramatic preference for laptops and a much lower frequency of use of desktops than to staff. And on first glance, we might think that perhaps this is because of some sort of um, digital natives in the books that maybe these are things that students feel comfortable with. But I think we can also consider that uh, staff are often provided with desktop computers in their offices. Students, of course, don't have offices. They're limited to what they can carry with them, so to have high uh, rates of laptop ownership. Mobile use among both groups was also lower, um, but I think we can explain that in another way that I'm sure we'll come to in a moment. But if, interestingly, um, among students at least, the rates of use of laptops and, sorry, of mobile phones and desktops were roughly equal. So I think that this shows that we need to consider how we're presenting content to our students. Um, I know that when I prepare for my lectures, for example, I'll think about how it looks on my screen. I'll also think about how it's going to look when I present it in the lecture theater and it's blown up on the big projector. What I didn't think about was how it would look when a student is accessing this on the bus on the way home on their tiny little iPhone screen. Um, so this is something that I think we can keep in mind, especially as uh, we know that attendance rates are a problem in the most. In terms of student comments, um, we see that they try, they would like to use their mobile phones more and to access its materials, but there are technological difficulties that look at this. So Moodle is enormously glitchy on one student's phone, there's no app available, so they have to use the browser and it's kind of things. So looking solely at uh, mobile Moodle, <coughs> we see that students show a stronger desire for a mobile version of Moodle than for staff. Um, and 92% of students desire a mobile version of and again, we might think this is attributable to the fact that they're digital natives, that they love technology, that their phones are attached to their hands and so forth. Um, but again, I think this has a lot to do with our campus culture and the kinds of resources and provisions that we make for students on campus. So things as simple as um, places to plug in a computer, what's going to hold charge for the moment, those sorts of questions. So students often like the kinds of um, resources in terms of PowerPoints and um, desks to work on that will start to be practical. In order to digitally participate in classes, laptops and smartphones are of course the most convenient and cost effective connections of most students. And we see that less than half of students have access to computer laboratories in terms of their actual schedule for the time to get the class times. Only a quarter have had access to one or more classes in one so when we're thinking about the kinds of devices that students are using, it's important to realize mm -hmm. how many actually have access to these <coughs> types of groups. In the good news though, um, in terms of the content on the website, we can see there's quite a lot of um, correlation between what students think is important, what they actually use, and what lecturers think is important and what they actually provide. So it would appear that there's a quite high degree of satisfaction here in terms of what we think is useful and what students think is useful for is going to use. So the content that staff predict will be useful to students is what they're actually providing, and then students indeed uh, do view this content as important. <coughs> uh, of course, another important element of Google is the communication and 
students have also positively responded in terms of recognizing the teacher's efforts. They've indicated that they're generally uh, satisfied with the response times that teachers have um, in terms of replying to comments or questions on social forums and things like that. Um, with 74 percent responding positively in addition to this, but there's always room for improvement, of course. Students also have um, very positive attitudes to online submission, um, considerably more so than teachers for the most part, although there were a proportion of students who found that it was much harder or less easy uh, to <coughs> submit things online. Interestingly, in the qualitative comments, we found that the students were complaining about one particular mode of assessment, which was the combined or hybrid assessment, where students were required to both submit a high copy and submit an online copy. So there was an indication that it was quite inconvenient and you were kind of removing the convenience of online submission by also requiring a high So that was uh, one area that change. One of the things that we did in the arts faculty, and I know this has been I'm sure a number of different faculties, was to, at the beginning of the implementation, we were developing a specific faculty based template. And this is a little snapshot of one of the to help guide staff in their first use of the Moodle um, platform, but also to help encourage some particular behaviours in terms of evidence use. In terms of the opinions and the feedback that we've had from staff, staff and students, um, most of them said that their ideas of the look of this were somewhere ranging between neutral to positive. 37% uh, said that it was so-so and 31% Students were overall more positive, which I find surprising, than staff were in their assessment. Um, only 9% on average gave a, a total negative opinion versus 20% of the staff, so I guess we're hard to please. 41% uh, said that it was excellent uh, versus 27% staff. However, the students were harsher in some areas. They, uh, 6% of students rated it as terrible. Uh, no staff were impolite enough to choose this option. <laughs> um, but interestingly, many of the questions and the quality of comments in the response to this question indicated that um, the issues were to do with the room itself as opposed to the specifics of the template. So some of those things we have been unable to fix. In terms of comparing to other group sites, 85% uh, of respondents said that it was better or the same. So in terms of the features that we've added to our template on the basis of the feedback, first of all, we've implemented collapse review so that students aren't bombarded with the entire semester's work and work in months when they first open it up. Completion tracking, so allowing students the option to tick off the checkboxes so that they can show to themselves as a memory device what they're working with. Uh, we updated the heading formats, so all of the headings um, are designed to encourage the use of weekly organization topics and also to specify what those topics are. We've highlighted a unit at the inbox so students are getting lost in terms of where are the basic information um, such as the unit guides, the lectures online, those kinds of things we made sure that that box is completely easy to see. And we've also introduced a new box with handy links to um, things that students can use to explain. Some of these have been provided by the library um, so we've been using a number of those resources such as And also new image suggestions added to the email. So now when student, uh, sorry, when staff create a new Moodle template, they will all receive a, an email which has suggestions of where they can find creative comments <coughs> um, images available for use to make their Moodle sites a little more attractive and also engaging. And we also prepared a quick guide for staff. So this quick guide summarizes all of the student feedback and gives ideas about students had more good things to say than bad things, which is always lovely to hear. Um, this is a little word of the the most frequently used items. And in terms of thematic clusters of comments here, 
we see that Chinese uploading collection materials was by far the most positively evaluated aspect of our use of community, so staff that we definitely need to be community for that. The thoughtful and weekly organisation of topics was also very much um, appreciated by students, so students like to see things in chronological order rather than having a board of lectures grouped in one place, one week, um, tutorial materials grouped in one place. So. And also in the online solution, although there was, as I mentioned, and uh, in terms of social media, um, whether it's an alternative to Google or not, I would suggest that in terms of the uses and the benefits that students and staff have identified, isn't. there are two very different um, uses of these particular tools. Namely, Moodle has been found to be useful for those kinds of content-based things, whereas social media was found to be much more conducive to social discussions, but also in Discussions that last longer than the teaching period. So, where you have students in a major who are progressing through different units, if each of the units has a different group site, uh, it's very difficult to keep that conversation ongoing. And it's very difficult also for mentoring relationships between students who have worked along in their degrees to come with those who are just studying um, and those kinds of things. We did find, though, that one eighth of students.
month the last that we are among the last speakers today because a lot has been said about what we are actually thinking or where we go with our project and um, it really affirms that what we are doing we're probably on the right track. Um, a lot of our guests this morning we're talking about engaging technology because they want to have engaged students. They want the students to take the responsibility of their own learning. A lot of our Monash scholars uh, talked about the same thing, just probably in a, in a different sphere. So what, what we're trying to, or what we're going to talk today uh, very briefly is about engaging students, not only in learning, but in all aspects of university life. Because we want our students to come to the campus as well as using technology and staying at home and you know, doing free classrooms. But we want them to engage in all aspects of um, university life. I think that's what we offer. Of course, modern universities have lots of challenges. I think that uh, many of us went to university where this was not reality. The reality was that you went to university because you had this ideal and you didn't really think about employment. You didn't really question your lectures. You didn't really, you know, you went to lectures and you sat there and you were given the content and you went home. Uh, however, uh, students at Monash are probably not like that anymore and I doubt that, you know, I think students anyway are very satisfied with just a very passive, passive role. Um, new technologies, you know, we've all talked about this Right. That's a huge challenge and I really uh, am thankful to our guest speaker this morning because he said don't try to keep up with everything because new things come up all the time and it's impossible. So we put in one good thing that's fantastic. Um, students' demographics are changing. University in Australia, uh, universities in Australia are open to everyone. It's not, it's not just for certain students, not just for certain class of students. The universities are there to cater for everyone. So expectations for students um, are multifold as well. The demands for greater accountability. I know probably for both universities we can all relate to ongoing um, uh, ongoing accountability to different bodies, to different uh, regulations, to the government, to our internal internal regulators and so on. Um, increasing cost of higher education is one of the probably quite the significant um, challenges for modern university and um, obviously the outside the public criticism of, of what they think university should provide or do or cater for. Government funding is reduced, that's no use, um, but it actually does impact significantly, significantly on that university and where university is going and you know, how are we going to fund our research as well as our teaching. Um, quite, a, quite a real challenge there. Less research money, internal demands, international rankings are huge, always um, looking for demand. So lots and lots of challenges. And we as, uh, you know, as university, as academics, as professional staff, we try to address them as well as we try to teach our students, we try to be there uh, for, for them. Now Monash is a research intensive university, so it's a real uh, question, are we shifting focus? Where are we going? Is, is research still there or is we still research focus or do we need to change the way how we actually approach our students? And, um, I think that the second one is pretty much um, the go. Um, but there's lots of questions. How are we going to do this? How are we going to have this fantastic classrooms and cater for students and put a lot of effort into teaching? Um, but then again, we also have to do a lot of research and we need to answer um, those questions as well. Is it wise to, to actually um, change the pedagogy to the student center? Is it worth it? If this is going to work, do we know? And uh, what do we actually need to know for this to happen? <coughs> okay, so we need to refocus on the students. So we need to ask who our students are, what our students want, where are they coming from, uh, what are we going to give it to them, and what, what, what are our graduate attributes. We're focusing on learning. So whatever you all spoke today, it was students taking responsibility for their own learning in one way or another. And whatever we try to do, at university we're trying to engage students so that they actually recognize learning and they take responsibility for their own learning. How 
do we then measure educational benefits and learning outcomes? Create environments and experience conducive to learning. So whatever we give to students in and outside the classroom, it's really, really important. So physical environment, online environment, um, and learning environments. We also need to provide student services, opportunities, facilities, um, programs, and, and so on, so that this student actually has an incentive to be engaged as a monarch student. Okay, so we the answer is yes. We all, we need to uh, we need to engage students, but how do we actually do this? And what benefits do we have if the students are engaged? Okay, as a university, the ultimate goal we hope is highly qualified graduates, graduates that are perfect scholars, graduates that someone you know mentioned today will be critical thinkers that will be able to go out, outside in the real world and be able to um, really contribute to the betterment of themselves and the betterment of society, being good humanists, social uh, scientists and so on. So that's all included in that little parcel. Engaged students obviously translate directly into high retention rate for universities. So, most of them will stay throughout their degree and hopefully continue to the postgraduate degree as well. High employability rates if the student, if the university is recognized and has a reputation as graduating those um, graduates, then obviously employability hopefully should be the, um, the outcome. Reputation of universities, uh, we, you know, lots of times we're focusing on international rankings, we're focusing on reputation of university because our students are our best um, and ambassadors. <laughs> increased load in terms of, not teaching load, but increased load in terms of, of enrollment. And of course, if we have increased students, uh, engaged students, we are hoping to have engaged alumni. It's too late in, in the fourth year or postgraduate um, to start building on alumni because they need to be feeling as part of the university from the very beginning. So student engagement we see as a group that is um, doing all this together and these are the major outcomes of the engaged student um, population. Then we started to ask ourselves what is the student communicator, what is the student engagement and we read so many um, articles and academic, um, academic research that you know, we were quite confused what it really is. So there's a definition that is different from person to person, what is the student engagement. However, what we need to find out that mostly student engagement definition focuses on teaching and learning, and very little of the literature actually examines anything that is outside classrooms. So outside classroom is still, there's lots of work to be done. But if we look at the, some of the major areas of student engagement, what would be with this, is particularly sense of belonging by a student to university. So if the student has that sense that he or she is a honor student, it's more likely that the student will be highly engaged. I mean, that goes back to a lot of psychological research and theories um, from you know, basic uh, human needs of belonging. We, we are humans, we are, you know, we are social beings and so on. So quite important. How do we do this? I don't have an answer to this, but uh, we all, I think we're all trying. Seeking, recognizing, utilizing learning opportunities. I think that's a, one of the most important issues, the most important um, points of student engagement, because whatever we are talking, we know that we want to increase student, um, student that the student will be able to recognize what is the learning outcome from whatever they're doing at university. Now that's a real challenge, because we as adults might see but the student might not see it in their core curriculum or extra curriculum activity. They might just think, oh, this is another thing that I have to do. So to, to actually um, communicate that, uh, not just expectation, but that there's a real value in extra core curriculum and out of classroom activities for students is very important because often that's the only time. So you know, they need to judge where this time is going to go. It's going to be spent on, on something that they don't see value of all are they going to pursue um, that. We, so lots and lots of different uh, 
um, definitions also point out that it's the student behavior. So the student engagement is basically a student behavior. So it's a student psychological behavior, social behavior, cultural behavior, physical. So whatever university life offers, if the student takes it, um, and that, you know, that's how students engage, student engage in, in rich university. And most importantly, students have to be active. So students can't just wait um, to be school fed. They need to be active, they need to be seeking, they need to be looking, participating, finding opportunities. Um, and there is thousands, basically, of curriculum, extracurriculum, and non-academic activities that they can participate in once they come to university. The question is for our students. Do we actually know who we cater for? And I'm sure that um, Kevin from business or marketing will say, well, we need to know who our, our clientele is. So maybe as, as a university, we need to start asking a little bit more often who our students are. Is it the demographics of the student changing? Or is it still the same as in 2010? Or is it still the same in 2005? Or is it, you know, is it very different? So the students, when they come, to university in the first year, they bring uh, a lot of baggage. We didn't know how to say that in a different way, but they come with their personality. With this, yeah, come from a, a definite social environment, is impacted on them, they experience. They hear about university reputation, form some opinion about Monash or any other university, and they have a certain level or not commit or commitment to university. So they come with their own level of motivation goal, are they goal oriented, um, are they persistent, curious. Um, from their social environment, their home environment, their family, their values, socioeconomic environment, the society, so that all impacts on who this person really is. Their previous experience, that would be the high school experience or previous academic experience if they are um, not directly from this high school or personal, personal. Uh, many students already work, so they, they understand how um, work life works. Uh, university reputation is really important, but uh, often they get it not only through marketing, they often get it through talking to other students, especially our international students. Uh, that is really, really important. And the question of commitment, are they here to just uh, try to try to get a degree or are they here to really get a degree, whatever it takes? Okay, so what do students expect from university? Is to, we kind of understand student engagement as university trying to cater, or to, trying to meet student expectations. And there is a lot of service, America and, and Australians, I have a few here, show you later on, that um, came out with a very definite ideas what students actually expect when before they come to university. That's really clear. Students are consumers. They pay, they expect the value for money, they are pretty uh, comfortable to ask for more or to ask to be catered for them, to be um, that you know, they expect that university will try to address the expectations. And these are the major expectations that came out through the student experience survey. And probability is obviously the most important. They expect that once they have a university degree from this university, they will be employable. The reality of the world is different, but they are young, often they are young, and, and that's the experience. Peer interaction is really important because they do come here, often not with a set of friends. Often they come as, you know, maybe as an individual, and they do, um, they, they expect they will meet, talk, collaborate with the peers. Often enough, yeah, often enough they, um, they expect um, more academic rigor than what university actually provides, um, which that's the best thing we've got. Active learning, they also, on that left, on that right side, induction, support of learning and getting help, that comes more from students who come directly from school. Schools are highly protective environments where a lot of help is given when students are guided through any difficulties and given a lot of support. So somehow these expectations, with these expectations, they come to university as well. And if they find they, that 
they don't have it to put, there's a lot of that disengaged, um, they start to disengage with the university because where do I go? This is a big place. Extracurricular activities they do um, expect that they will be able, they will be able or required to, to uh, participate. Universities do try to meet these expectations. They try through various academic uh, engagement programs. I mean, this is this is just a very short list, but they, this list could go on and on. If you start talking about everyone is doing with we, we inside the um, academic programs. So, very structured curriculum, core curriculum, extracurricular activities, flexible programs. A lot of our students work. Um, they do access Moodle, they access um, lectures that are recorded, um, internet um, um, tools and so on. They do access academic support at the library would probably um, search that. The academic peer and interaction programs, communicating by academic expectations, extension programs and so on. So there is a lot of effort put into meeting those expectations. So these are just some of academic engagement programs, and there's a whole range of oops, sorry, whole range of non-academic or student affairs engagement programs like sport, physical well-being, mental health support, prevention, career counselling, counselling, volunteering, community engagement, social justice. Really, a, a range of um, areas where they can participate outside the classroom. I mean that. They might think that that has nothing to do with the learning, but it actually is a very big, um, very big contributor to the learning and to to uh, that's how university provides this program for students to take the opportunities to see opportunities. Because in real life, you are not always told what you have to do, and they, they are skills from these activities that they learn that are invaluable. I, when we were doing a lot of research on um, student, engagement, student engagement, we of, often uh, we stumbled across um, Chickering and Gamson's student engagement principles. And interesting enough, a lot of talks today would incorporate one of these of, uh, of, of these principles. So it's really important. So there are seven basic principles that the students are engaged. So if we try to address most of them, or at least try um, on some of them, we might not do so well, then uh, it's likely the students will appreciate it and, and take the aim to um, the engagement. So is it out of, class, out of class, class activities worth it? Are they wise to do? If we think yes, it's, you know, uh, because all activities aim at enhancing students' learning, so they will learn something from anything they do. Um, of core and extracurricular activities extend students' learning experience and all non-academic uh, experience, all non-academic activities enhance students' university experience. So they will finish university and they'll say, you know what, I've learned a lot but I also had a great time. I was volunteering, I was doing my sport, I was helping the library and so on. And positive experience, students' experience obviously leads or hopefully leads to a higher level of student engagement. With higher level of student engagement, we are again with, with our puzzle where you know, it benefits to students and obviously benefits to university as a institution as well. So that's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
that we can actually say that that's valid for our students. Thank you once again. This is for Kevin, actually. Uh, he did mention earlier regarding the problems with the international students, the mastering of the English language. It is understandable that they are finding it very, very difficult because English language is their second language. And therefore, they are not able to communicate with their lecturers. And worse still, when they are together, they will always speak in the same their local language. I would suggest, if Kevin would agree, uh, that the international students particularly make it a point to socialize with the local students so that they are able to learn at the same time, being able to express themselves in a language that is not theirs. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, just to, to uh, look at that, one of my parts of research is I went to Vietnam and I interviewed uh, graduates, business graduates of Monash and said, uh, now you've graduated three years later, what's the value of your degree? And part of the things that came out of that, that um, this was about 2006 and Vietnam was opening up to the World Trade Organization at, at that particular time, and there were two groups of students. There was, or graduates, one group of graduates came to Australia, lived with Vietnamese, taught Vietnamese when they went home, and just went to, uh, to university. The second group, in actual fact, lived with other nationalities, uh, had part-time work, and so forth, and they clearly had far better English skills. And the graduates were actually complaining, who got higher marks, but couldn't, didn't have the same English skills, were complaining that they weren't getting the new jobs because English was a requirement. And, and uh, one of the things is you're able actually to explain that to, to the students to start off with. This is the reality, so this is what you should be doing. The second thing is, is the four-hour class uh, that we conduct just gives us that extra hour to enable them to network. Now, it's not just the, inter the Australian students, the domestic students are problem. Quite often the international students gang up on the domestic students and don't want to talk to them because we hear that when they form a group assignment. So it's a two-way process. But to actually be able to do that in a non-threatening environment, in class, have a good time, uh, mix and talk during that extra period, that extra hour is just so valuable in terms of helping that integration. Um, and it really works. Both sides. Thank you. Now we've probably only got time for one more question. I really... I have one question for Kevin. I was interested when you mentioned that uh, you offer the students bonus when they do positive uh, things. At the same time, they will be penalised. Uh, I think in some organisations or uh, even societies, the word penalty is taboo. So I just wonder if you would share with us what are some of the penalties that you impose on your students and what are your students' views about it and also the organisation at large. Thank you. Now remember, they're Monash, they're Monash students. <laughs> so they want bonus marks, they don't want penalty marks. But the penalty marks are largely devised by the students and voted on. Bonus marks are about things like profitability and so forth, where there's an element of luck in any simulation game. So you acknowledge that and you say, look, I want you not to try and get the most profit, I want you to try things. You can still get 100%. But they, they work towards the bonus marks. The penalty marks is the class will only work if people will answer the telephone correctly. It will only work if they're polite to one another. It's only polite if they operate in a business environment. So at the end of every training session, we have a self-regulatory committee to show them how self-regulation works. They might say, um, Matthew, Matthew wasn't asking the telephone and so forth. And we'll ask Matthew, is this true? And then we'll have a vote, we might give you a warning. Second time, we might then apply a penalty mark. But largely what happens through that process, so you don't just slam them like that, but through the process, you, you end up with very few penalty marks and it's all about the bonus marks, it's all about the positives. But what that does for me is it has an orderly market, which is what I provide. Thank you. Again, hesitate, but we are going to move on to Professor Masna Hussain's uh, presentation on the virtual learning environment and designing to please. And there are seats available. We may just need to move a few, uh, some bags. So please come and find a seat.
Again, I'm very grateful to all the uh, presenters and I'd like to welcome, in fact, this collaboration started in a way because Mason and I worked on a collection of essays on implementing ICT into higher education and I've been very lucky to have visited Mason at the University of Malaya and now at the uh, Ulen, so I thank Mason very much for the sense being the, the spark of this research collaboration. So over to Mason, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, and a very good morning to everyone who's still on afternoon. <laughs> I'm sorry, afternoon. Um, I'm Raja Masna, or you can call me Masna from UUM. This is my fifth month in UUM. I've since moved from the University of Naya after 30, more than 30 years, 31 years of um, engaging with the university and trying to change the research university, so I think it's about time that I take an early time money away and move north. And I'm, how many of you know where UUM is, the, the university? Except for Matthew. It's about uh, 15 minutes from the Thailand border. We are that close. We have tigers in, in the <laughs> The is vice chancellor is right there, you can ask him. Right, um, it's a new place for me and when I went there for the first time to, to, to visit my son and to, it was, um, I was an external examiner to Nora's student and I saw the campus and I thought that was a few people and they've been trying to get me to move to UUM eventually and I did it. I moved and I left my responsibility as a staff developer. I've been holding the post of uh, academic development center director director uh, trying to change, uh, try to uh, transform academic staff to become better teachers, but of course they are not interested, they are more interested in research. But we managed to put in a few uh, init um, rather initiatives in place than I have. So I hope it works. Uh, usually you don't stay when you bring change, right? Just move on. Right, um, this is, um, my background is I'm, I'm an instructional technologist instructional designer, been teaching that for the past 30 years and been helping the ministry with a lot of work with uh, helping higher education to move and also with a smart school to remember that once upon a time um, Malaysia launched this smart school um, that was in 1997, 96 and it didn't really work for us and now we're moving into something new. So always things are always changing. So
and the focus should be on providing services to the teachers and students. We are trying to provide students with an anytime, anywhere learning experience and teachers with all the services they need to facilitate that learning. We are trying to provide teachers with the data they need about their students so they can be productive in their teaching practices and personalize their instruction. This is from the Horizon report last year. Key trends for higher education, work, learn, study, whenever and wherever. Online learning, hybrid learning, collaborative models, open content, open data, open resources, informal learning, massive open online courses. This is something which we are all scratching our head right now because the minister suddenly said, yes, we want all the public universities to, to move the MOOC with. This still, so, uh, if, you, if you talk all day about MOOC, but I'm not going to see anything about it. But students use own technology for learning and personalizing the learning experience. Now, looking at innovating pedagogy, we, we need to ask ourselves, um, do we still need the medieval model of professorial authority? What effect does it have on students socializing the culture of speed and impatience, network and immediacy? In what ways can we explore new forms of teaching, learning and assessment? And how do we guide educators and policy makers? This is something which I think it's very difficult to, to talk to policy makers in one after another. Uh, they come back with innovation and they think it's innovative. And, and they say, okay, now head of teaching and learning, we'll do something about it. Because I've been there in that position for, for the last many, many years. <laughs> Heading the center, you know, trying to translate the policy. Now, we know that learning is strongest when the learner is actively involved in the creation of understanding and the application of understanding to real problems. Knowledge generation is better than knowledge duplication. And we know that. And we tell the students that. Okay, this is our National Higher Education Plan for Malaysia. I have highlighted the yellow. Higher education institution academic staff are today expected to be leaders in the field of teaching. Okay, and teaching staff form the front line of this transformation and must focus on innovative delivery of curriculum. And we even put this in our critical agenda project as mentioned by Nora. Uh, earlier we, we had uh, about 10 KPI under teaching and learning. And finally, a month ago, I'm, I'm in the committee, we have decided to bring it down to three. So the three will be the KPI for the liberal education, the use of liberal education practices. And the second one is the grant. We're asking for university to provide at least 1% of their research grant to give to teaching, research on teaching. That's the, this is the second year for, for that particular KPI. And the last one is the graduate <coughs> attributes. How do we know that what we are doing is successful? So we have to have that third KPI. And now, this is our Ministry of Education, the vision that was for the 2005 document, and it's still valid. Um, we are looking at teachers creating, publishing personalized content online. There are also virtual mentors. Learners access, have access to virtual mentors. Learners learn in communities. Tools, emerging technologies, virtual learning, virtual reality. The pedagogy will be community-based and constructivist learning, experiential and project-based. Mm -hmm. And materials are personalized to learners for the purpose of engaging learners in learning. And we know that we have the technology now to provide and monitor these opportunities inside and outside of the normal classroom. Right, this was the, uh, the conceptual <coughs> framework that me and a, another colleague of mine uh, we presented that to the smart school division then in 2010. And it's still valid. What we are saying is this is what is happening in the classroom right now. And we hope to that school will enhance the teaching and learning through the use of 21st century tools and pedagogies. And, and we all know this is what we want, the wholesome self-directed learners with the four R, four Cs, 21st century skills, and the outcome is for everyone. At the end of the day, can we supply that workforce 
the global and knowledge workers. Um, this is again just to, to, to put the context of where the, this research, the Soto and Poyet, is about. We are focusing so much on the discovery, the researching on your discipline discovery, but we forget that someone has to do research also on teaching, and therefore we are also encouraging people to do research on their teaching. At the ministry level, we're pushing, we're designing and uh, training scholarship of teaching and then we take training the higher education teachers so that we can see that yes you can publish also on your teaching not just on your discipline and it's also recognized now <coughs> the research to identify important elements of the scholarship of teaching and learning that focuses on the pedagogy of integration of ICT Education. I like acronyms, so there's a poet and there's, a, there's a, all these things here. Uh, to improve practice through research inquiries and to mentor instructional designers and postgraduate students. I work a lot with my master students and my PhD students, but they work with me on my teaching, on my uh, social work. And they graduate with their masters and their PhDs. Later I'll show you some of the work that the students did. Okay, why do we need to relate SOTEL to forward? Uh, we're looking at refle reflectively inquiring into teaching improvement for student engagement using ICT, discovering the ways our students learn in ICT enhanced learning environment, and promoting innovations in teaching and learning, as innovation is closely tied to the application of latest pedagogy in ICT, knowledge to improve practice, and rewarding SOTEL practice or rather social activities would eventually lead to innovation in teaching and learning and making public our practice and sharing experiences in the learning community. So the intention is not just at the university level but also at the national level since I'm also involved at the national and university. So we try to fit this everywhere, try to make the change. These are the research questions that I asked. Uh, what is the best way to use emerging technologies in helping students learn? And how do students learn in personalized learning environments? And what pedagogical change is needed to personalize learning and to engage students with emerging technologies? And what kind of support is needed for lecturers to practice total poet? So the question number two and number three is very, very important. This is about change? How do we transform ourselves, our practices? <coughs> this is from the document or rather the framework from the FES UK and that's where the personalized learning is about effective teaching and learning, curriculum, curriculum entitlement and choice, school as learning organization beyond the classroom assessment for learning. Those are things that we try to work on and make the change. Okay, the key elements to this or personalized learning environment and student engagement is based on the construct outlined by Becca, uh, to tailor content to user needs and learning styles. So from there, we just tailor the content. How do we do that? that that's where the, the, the students will do the research and to find how do we do all this? How do we provide continuity of learning and of others' learning? How do we support any time anywhere learning? And how do we enable Peer and mentor dialogue, how do we assess learners for learning, and how do we involve learners in their own learning? Those are mm -hmm. all research questions which need to be researched. Mm -hmm. And these are the case studies that we, we did for the Bachelor of Education, uh, postgraduate masters in instructional technology, postgraduate before my education. And at that time, when, uh, this was like five years ago, I had more, about 15 PhD students under me. So I had to have something online so that, so that I can meet everybody at one time in terms of community of learners under me. Okay. Now we're looking at, we're all guilty about the new thinking when, when we use e-learning, we just uploading things and help hope that the students will download and there's no, no thinking involved at all. 
And when we move to the next level, that's where we tell the students, adapt it, read it, do something about it, answer my body or something. So low order thinking there. But we are looking at higher order thinking. How do we get them to create new things, come up with new innovation, to initiate things? So in, uh, in pleasing the students, we say we have to please the students, have faith in them, and support their learning through coaching and mentoring. We have to do a lot of coaching and mentoring. I'm also a certified coach, so I, I'm lucky in that sense I could use some of those uh, principles with, with my students. Model the philosophy, the use of strategies and supporting mm -hmm. technologies. I have to model it and my tutors have to model it so that the students can learn from you. Otherwise, you tell them to do something but you are not doing it. So it's not right. Uh, engage students in learning through careful instructional design and development. We sit down, me and my tutors after the class, we all say, okay, what did we do right today? Shall we do it differently? This work, this does not work. And she's always online with me and emailing me when she finds something from the students' uh, Facebook and she will just <coughs> tell me this is what's happening, that's in this class, etc. Okay. And support online learning through scaffolding, regular feedback, and monitoring of student learning. It's a lot of work. When we did the work with the undergraduate, there were about 80 students, but I was lucky I had about four tutors with me. So we managed to divide the group, so you take care of this group, you take care of this group, and so that it works. Because if you try to do it by yourself, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. That, that's what puts uh, off a lot of people when they go online and say, I've got too many students, I cannot do this. Um, these are things that guided us, the learning theories, the instructional design models, and feedback, the technology, pedagogy, and contact knowledge. And this is the instructional design model which I used a lot. If you look at the center where you center the problem in real world, so my, my, my students will work with real clients, real projects, and they work in group. Solve real problems, be it instructional design problems or be teaching and learning problems. And center in the problem, you activate the students' prior knowledge, demonstrate what is it that you want them to be able to learn and to do, get them to practice it, and finally do integration. So this is the, the first principle by David Montmello, a combination of many instructional design models. Now, phases of engagement model, this was earlier somebody asked the question. You want the student to become self-directed, independent learners, and we know this is how it works. In, the, in trying to get the students to engage, initially, a lot of work has to be done by you. Your role is bigger at the orientation level. When you go on online, learning online is about orientation, construction, collaboration and initiation. Eventually, the role of students should be bigger than you. That's when they will start initiating discussion. They become self-directed. So you just let go. You become the community. You hear this? Now, at the orientation level, you are the social negotiator. Begging them, please come in. Look for them if they are lost. Because the first two weeks, some of them may be missing. You have to go to them face to face, call them up. How come I don't see you online yet? And they say, Oh, I've, I've lost my, my very, I've lost my password. I lost it. Simple thing like that. So we have to help and get other students to help. And construction, this is where you become the structural engineer. You design your online learning, and you want them to cooperate with you. Tell them what you are doing. So they come in, they cooperate, and finally, <coughs> your role will slowly become a facilitator when they are collaborating, they are already working on their projects. So they have to collaborate, and eventually, you are just a community member. <coughs> now, this is, uh, some of the posters that I'm showing are posters that we have presented at our university lab. We have yearly we have events that where we showcase our research. And these are some of the things that we have done. We, this is a poster on a research that we did on how to, how to looking at 
the four soft skills that we have developed in our class, and that's our framework, and look, the tools that we have used, we have used Yahoo, Google, Messenger, and we'll put the technology there. Um, okay, this is something that was um, from a, a class, it was a class on instructional design, and there were four groups, and they worked with the entrepreneur development center at the university. So we really use the actual client. What is it that you need? Say, okay? So <coughs> the first group designed the training. So we needed a tra training, they say. So we designed the training, tested it out, and reported the training. And the other group worked on online web-based platform for the new entrepreneurs or the young entrepreneurs that we are developing to come in and work together. And the third one is the guidebook. And while they're doing this, they're more learning about instructional design. They're learning to work with the real clients and developing products. So this is the viral video that they, another group developed just for the use uh, for that particular group of uh, clients. Okay, this is a PhD work looking at self-directed learning. How do you empower? How do you develop that capacity and capability in the students for self-directed learning? So this was a, a one semester course that she came in as a tutor. I was teaching instructional design and she worked on this for her PhD to, to identify all those answers to her questions. <coughs> and we, we had the virtual learning space and of course the physical learning space and we supported them on online and we allowed them to use whatever technology that they wanted to, to use and we monitor looking at the data that, they, that was generated from the discussions, the face-to-face, -face, the forum and yeah, okay. And here is um, from that class also, this is a master's project, it was looking at inquiry learning. Was there inquiry learning in this class? Did it take place? So, what I'm always telling my students, it's not that difficult to find research topics because oftentimes students find it difficult. How do I do research in uh, master's in instructional technology or PhD in instructional technology? So look at the classroom itself. There's plenty of research that you can do. Um, okay, this is a master's uh, research. She was uh, using SIPWiki, or no, we were using SIPWiki for that particular environment, class environment. And looking at benchmarking, because when you use wiki, they work on their projects. So that if there are four groups, the four groups will have different wikis. So we, are, we encourage the wiki to be open, that anybody else can come in and comment, everybody can see. So we are looking at the effect of benchmarking. So you are able to benchmark your work with other groups' work. What happened? So that was the research question. Um, Okay, and this is another one that we use Facebook for the whole semester. We use the Facebook and we wanted to know whether we can use Facebook as an e-portfolio tool. So we did that. We worked with them and we were teaching them reflective or how to, or rather re reflection of learning through reflection. And this is another master's project also. She was using Google Apps as portfolio and she was using it with her class. Um, okay, this is another one with uh, YouTube. Okay, this is my my class actually for undergraduate. They had to develop a three minutes three minute video to put it on YouTube. We set a space on YouTube and we say your marks will be based on the feedback that you get from the world opening to the class, to the world. So they were very excited about developing something that's really world-class to say, to, to be able to put it on YouTube and to let others come in. And people do come in and give comments and thank the students for it. And they were working with uh, primary school topics, English and maths and science. And they were developing videos, putting three minutes video online. So we are looking at the ownership, the engagement, the opportunities, and how they collaborate. Uh, 
And this is a PhD project that he was using model in his institution uh, to teach Arabic. And this is also this is a master's project. She worked with teachers to to develop that community of practice. And this was a tough project for her and to convince the teachers to stay because they come in. Initially they come in but they, they leave very soon. And she said for she had to have a, a Noritake set as a as a carrot to dangle. So if you are you come in the most, if you have contributed the most, you bring the Noritake set. So all kinds of things that teachers would do. And this is a PhD project she worked with. Um, with the, with the avatar, the, um, what's the, what's that space? Yeah. Second life, yeah. She used second life, yeah. Look on her PhD, and this is my, another master's student. So she has been studying my, my, my training. I, I, I did training on pleasing with LMS, so please with LMS, because at that time we, we have this introduced Moodle to the, campus community, so we had to help them to the, the, the pedagogical side, not the technical side. So I had to put everything, applying all these uh, principles of engagement. Uh, and yeah, and I have a paper later that we can, uh, can also retrieve the paper later on this. Okay, this is a PhD. She's uh, finished this about five, five months ago, eventually. Uh, facilitating the development of self-directed learning through the design of an e-social constructivist learning environment. It's a qualitative research and she has some survey data to what mostly qualitative. And yeah, this is a modeling personalized learning that my paper was presented in Southampton. Right, so how did we collect data? Data collection, we have both qualitative and quantitative data. For the qualitative data, we have the open and the post evaluation instrument. Every at the end of the semester, I will make sure that the students answer the post evaluation. Uh, contents of the forums, the students' forums, their e portfolios, their blogs and wikis, and also interviews and focus groups to collect the data. And for the quantitative data, we have student profile, learner frequency or the frequency of students' participation in online classroom and end of semester feedback. This is the back end of Moodle that we harvest the, those data from Moodle. And of course, that's the instructional design model that eventually uh, evaluation is central to what we do. Now, lesson learned. What did we learn from that research? From the learner's perspective, learners learn through experience and actively participated in relating, creating, and donating knowledge. They have to relate to each other, relate in the, to other students, relate to the tutors, relate to the uh, facilitators, and they create because of the project-based learning, or rather the project that they have to, to do, they have to create something, and at the same time, the forum and everything becomes new knowledge for others to come in and learn from them, and that's where the knowledge is donated. Okay, engagement here concerns a student's attitudes and commitment to study. Okay, whereas our empowerment focuses on their competency to do so effectively, and students actively co-author their educational script. They co-author, they work together in their group, and students independently manage their learning using technology. They become very good at that. And learning outcomes are achieved simultaneously learners develop lifelong learning skills. That's something which, which we we wanted to develop in our graduates and students develop as researchers. Now, from the technology perspective, we were using several Web 2.0 tools and, and we can embed that into our course through the use of problems and activities allowing for action and reflection to take place. There's a lot of uh, doing things and reflecting on things. So I work with teacher trainees so we wanted to develop reflective practitioners, so eventually they, they do a lot of reflection. Okay, the tool also accorded students the unconditional environment to evaluate and provide the feedback. Uh, I have a PhD student right now working on feedback, just for the feedback. How do we teach students to give feedback? Because it's not easy. 
So we develop the, all the online uh, presence, but they come in, oh, that was a good one. That was not so good. That was, but we wanted more than that. How do we do that? So I'm waiting for her to finish writing her PhD. <laughs> Technologies and enabler allowing for learning to be supported in a time and place. For the, from the pedagogical perspective, we found, or rather, please, personalized learning environment and students' engagement allows the teacher to examine personal pedagogical beliefs and approaches. Or we can say also, please allow the teachers to, to do this. Okay, please requires teachers to bring up the final instructional design process models the ICT culture and behavior, and provides scaffolding that allows room for independence and creativity. And this also allows the development of meaningful and efficient learning. Okay, um, that's my publication there, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Massa. I'm hoping you'll be willing to take some Questions from the floor? Yes, yes, sure. Okay, so any questions from Masna? And then we may even just open the floor up to general discussion or questions for any of the presenters today. Please, sir. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, how are uh, all this open learning and active learning being implemented in schools? Uh, because I see university is really an extension of what the student had experienced in school. Um, and then, you know, they get more developed at university level. So how is that being done at the school level in Malaysia? With difficulty, I would say. <laughs> but because what, what I'm saying yeah. then, if we yeah. try to implement this at university level, um, but then the students come in with a huge gap uh, from school, the, uh, how do you cater for the needs? What they are doing right now is changing the assessment system, which is the school-based assessment. But from what I heard, the latest is that they are put a hold on it first because the teachers are not ready. It's a lot of work, and and, and to me, I, I feel when when you are too uh, tied to the system because what they wanted was a system that's ready for the teachers to go in and input and key in all the things, and the system will will break down. And the teachers say, I have to wait hours and hours to key in students' work. So, to me, go to the good old feedback, write on paper, just tell the parents what they are, how their children are doing. But that, so now, they, they, I think they're trying to get the system better. I don't, I don't know much about it. You guys know more about like as for example, we are trying to improve the, the program. Mm. Uh, the problem that the, the teachers, in terms of assessment, so yeah. In terms of assessment, they are supposed to key in the marks uh, when they have gone through the the, the uh, chapter or whatever. Right. And control of that, that, that. If they have uh, difficulties to key in, maybe they have to break out at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. Right. So, so now they're going to blame the technology for that. But the concept, yeah. Then you say another program now uh, that we can easily access the mm. Thank you. But we're trying to sell the idea that yes, you can support your student learning throughout school through school-based assessment, not just at the end of the year give them the the final exam. So, so that's the idea of the having issue. a school-based assessment yeah. is good. But I think my personal opinion that overseas, yes, can do. maybe the ideal classroom here is like. Yeah. like 15, 20 per yeah, class, but in Malaysia about 30 for yeah. 30 to 40 students per class. So, that is the so it's still very hiring for teachers, and we don't have teachers helpers also. I, I remember UK would, would have teacher aid. Teacher aid, yeah. yeah, but we don't have. So that is something which which is still to me I see as a stumbling block. But the idea itself is good. So we, we are hoping by praying that it will work, it will be smoother later. Yeah, can I take another question? I think they're just, we're all just digesting. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of information. Yeah. Yes. Well, please have a seat. As I can maybe for a couple of minutes, we may just open the floor to questions of any of the presentations today. 
before we move to lunch, um, typically we end off by thanking the presenters, but I think the presenters would actually also like to thank the audience for their attendance, very much so, and also for enduring what is something we don't have any control over in terms of the heat. So we have uh, all of the presenters here, so if anyone would like to, and then I'll ask Professor Noor to conclude with some general final remarks on the seminar today. I'm just trying to get up UUN's website as well. So if you... Any questions for Sarah or for Kevin? Uh, there was also Jelani, Dr. Jelani, and <coughs> Noura, and Marta. I would say we, we have generated a lot of um, interesting discussions today. There's some areas which I think we could work together, we could collaborate, and I suppose we should take each other's part and email. Just please feel free to email me and, and the team if there's anything that we can work together. To really want to be, uh, we will keep in touch with the main list. If anyone here but not on the main list, uh, then yeah. And I'm wondering about access to the PowerPoint. Would people be happy to share the PowerPoint as a resource? It can be. Uh, seeing as people are a little bit uh, hesitant to say too much. Thank you. Can I just follow on from that comment? Um, we're looking for all the assistance we can get in this echo with, with what we're doing. Um, one of the, our mission statement is to improve the human condition um, in the countries within our region. So certainly we are looking to do as much as we can um, with, with anyone, but, uh, because the Malaysian people here are of course not. Yeah, well, we would love to learn from you. Uh, we, we have tried to, in fact, again, talking about critical agenda project, we, earlier we put in one of the KPI as learning space to make sure if, if you talk about student learning, self, um, or rather, um, student-centered learning, but if the environment is still very old-fashioned, it's all about instructor-centered learning, it's not going to work. The instructor